Good afternoon, everybody. Barry McGuire here for Barry McGuire's Creative Real Estate Education Group. It's live at five, every Thursday, five o'clock mountain. We gather as a group and we talk about uh, things interesting to real estate investors, to real estate people uh, generally. We've had some really, really interesting guests talking about all kinds of topics. And today, um, we're going on a, a bit of a different tack. We've got Dale Keller here from Calvert Mortgage. Calvert's out of Calgary, family-owned company. Dale's second generation in this business. Um, and uh, Dale is, uh, they're, they're a private lender. So they have a niche in the market that is a really worthwhile and valuable niche for investors. When you need money to tide you over from, from one place to another where uh, big banks won't lend to you because your project just doesn't fit their model, um, when you need pretty fast action, uh, Calvert is an excellent source for you. And so the thing we're going to talk about today is valuation. Valuation. What are properties worth? And that's important for all of us, isn't it? I mean, if you're... If you think that, um, if you think, let's say you're a fix and flip person and you think you you need uh, uh, a certain percentage gap between what you can acquire the property at and what uh, you can turn it out at, knowing what the property is really worth, especially in one of those distressed property situations, is uh, incredibly, incredibly important. If you're looking to joint venture with somebody uh, and you think you're going to take a property in, uh, renovate it or secondary suite it and do something with it and you want to talk to a joint venturer uh, you're looking to get your equity out and valuation is really important and of course it's um you know it's important really important when you're a lender and especially when you're in the private lending market people want you to move fast they want uh they don't want to give us uh, as much money down they, they want all sorts of things that calvert can supply and one of the reasons that they can supply in this market niche is because they're pretty darn good at valuation. So with that um, introduction, we're going to bring in Dale Keller and we're going to get him to firstly. Hey, Dale. Hello. Nice to see you again. That big smile, smile for us. Dale, look at that. See, look, look at this big charming smile. It's great. Um, we're going to get Dale to just maybe give us a, a, a bit more of an overview about uh, who Calvert Mortgage is, what, what part of the market they serve, why they're a resource for we investors, and, and how valuation fits into what uh, Calvert does. And so with that, Dale, give us a bit more on Calvert and we can carry on. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. I really appreciate being here and being able to chat about this. Um, it's actually kind of odd to have a lender talk about valuations. We usually let appraisers do that kind of work, but there is some good family and business history around our company and why we have become professionals in, in valuation as well. Um, my dad, uh, Barry mentioned that I'm second generation in my business. My dad started the company, um, uh, I think 1975. So been around a little while. And uh, when he started lending money, he realized really quickly that if he became the appraiser as well, he could get deals done quicker. So he didn't have to send out a third party person to understand the value. And he also really figured out that if I can understand the value, I can make decisions quicker and, um, and also be more educated about the investments I'm making in a mortgage that is the security for that, uh, that property. So, um, so he went and got his um, appraising license or rather credentials, but never credentialed himself. Um, and uh, he really taught me in the business to, uh, to understand value. And, and uh, now I, I don't do very many valuations. We have a full-time candidate appraiser on staff who does that for us. And um, it's amazing how many we get a chance to do. Our, she's a powerhouse, this woman who does our valuations. She probably does five or six a day um, if, she's, if she's busy. Um, and she loves it. She used to be an appraiser who would have to visit all of those properties, but now she sits in her cozy office and doesn't have to leave the property to go and look at all these properties. So she's also very, very pleased with her job uh, doing that. So she, that's what it enables her to do so many. Um, and so uh, 
One of the things I'm going to share a little bit later is uh, really the tool that she helped build to help do those valuations so quickly. Um, we uh, we really want to be professionals in understanding value um, quickly for lots of different reasons. Um, but as Barry mentioned, we we do a lot of loans where we're short term lending um, and we support a lot of real estate investors buying, fixing up and reselling property. And uh, surprising to us, that isn't every appraiser's skill to value a property on an as-is basis, as well as, hey, if I add these renovations to the property, what does that value look like at the end? Because a property that's purchased at $100,000, $50,000 renovation doesn't necessarily equal $150,000 value. There's a different perspective that needs to be added to that. So it's, uh, it's, it is a bit of a different skill, which is an amazing way for real estate investors to get an upward lift on their hard work, which is what a lot of real estate investors are, are after. So um, understanding that value on an as is basis, as well as um, after I give you this vision of the budget and renovations, I'm gonna invest in it, what is it worth at that point in time? So um, we, love, we love supporting real estate investors in that kind of deal. That really gets us excited. Um, and we like to play little games with ourselves about, you know, did we did we hit the mark right when it sells? Because we get some pretty um, quick real time feedback about uh, the property and what it does sell for, which is also not very typical of a lot of lenders. A lot of lenders are in the game to lend long term money and less about the short term uh, game. So they don't necessarily see the property selling in the same market that they valued it in. Um, so we get really good feedback, not just in the valuations that we do from the people that we work with, but from the market itself saying, Dale, you were wrong. I was able to sell it for even more than you thought I was. I thought it was worth. So uh, that makes this game a lot of fun for us, too. All right. Well, I didn't know uh, that's an interesting tidbit that, that your dad figured out if if he was good at valuation, he could move fast. And, uh, and, uh, and that's a, that's a big, uh, that's a big talent and a big tool in your toolbox. Cause I know that often when people come to see you, they need speed, they need speed. And, and so that, uh, yeah, I can see that where that would be, uh, where that would be huge for you. Yeah. Yeah. And where it really comes in handy, like not just for flippers, um, although that's a pretty big market. We, we, um, we service. We also service people who might be buying, renovating, and then refinancing uh, for a long-term hold strategy, um, or just simply people who don't. They got a really good deal, but they don't have time to get the bank financing. And so, if they can get that speed to an approval, maybe they can actually act. Um, maybe they can get the property for even cheaper. We we certainly have clients who maybe offer a loan, or offer a purchase rather. Um, maybe conditional to 24 hours or unconditional period. And they're on their way to the property saying, Dale, will you lend me this money? Um, and, and we can make uh, decisions on a yes, usually within a business day, including the valuation. Um, if we've got, especially if we've got some notice, you know, um, and they've, they've got all their, their um, answers to the questions about how their renovation is going to look and, and what they're going to spend and where they're going to invest their money to improve the property. So, um, yeah, we certainly see uh, if speed matters to the seller, sometimes they're willing to accept a little less for the price of the property. And that is a huge advantage for, for the real estate investor, obviously. Okay, folks. So everybody who's listening, um, I hope you're, I hope you're understanding uh, the importance of, of what Dale said, because um, for all of you who have uh, gone to get a, a conventional loan, been to see your bank, use the mortgage broker, uh, you're buying a property, you need a mortgage. Um, I mean, the process is, is laborious. Uh, it's piecemeal. It, if you can get a loan in two weeks, you know, you've got a lender or a broker who's really on the stick. Uh, if you can get it without uh, being uh, just one more thing to death, you know, you think you've supplied everything and, you, you know, you're pretty sure it's done. And the broker goes, just one more thing. Sorry, I know the underwriters. And so uh, now you're three weeks into it and, and you still 
are struggling to to get a mortgage. So yeah. uh, that's what conventional borrowing is like. And if you're in a situation where you can get a you can get a property uh, at a really good price, if you could close in say three days, then um, you're not going to get it through conventional lending. You're just not. You will lose that property. Uh, on the other hand, if you know somebody like Calvert exists, then uh, and if you're in that market, I mean, I heard Dale say that he's uh, they can maybe turn it around in one business day, and I'm pretty darn sure Dale doesn't want to turn them around in one business day, uh, and can only really do that if you've done all your homework and you can give him everything that he needs to do his his evaluation and to decide whether he's going to make that loan. So, if you want to take advantage of what uh, what Dale can provide, you you should probably have a conversation with him. And he will tell you what he needs in order to do quick loan approvals. And then when you're out looking, you will have gathered all of that material or most of that material, except what might be particular to the property. And then if you have to jump, you can give Dale what he needs and he can and he can move quickly. So that's a really good conversation to have. Okay. Right. So Calvert's a really good resource. Don't forget that. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Barry. And and it's true. Like if we if we know the client in advance, we know they're shopping. We can kind of get generally a pre approval, so to speak, uh, on board. Just we get to know you and what you're what you're in the market to do and buy and and uh, get those initial conversations out of the way when they're not a rush. When then when you do have a rush deal, we can help you out quick because because we've done away with a little bit of the formalities and so on. But but when we're Dealing with real estate investors, particularly, we try and take the same point of view as you will with regards to the property. Are you going to be profitable? Does the does the does the deal make sense from your point of view? That's one really real reason why we love doing valuations, because we want to assess your profitability um, and and back you on that. And if we don't see profitability, we want to be honest and transparent and and show you that. And sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes real estate investors teach us about something about a property that we didn't notice. And we say, oh, well, we'll, we'll readjust our valuation. Sometimes we're educating them about some risks that we see that uh, they may have missed. And we're happy to share that. So, so. All right. Well, let's, let's, um, this has all been a really good lead up, I think, into the, the topic of valuation itself. So, I mean, I'd like to hear you talk about, um, uh, for for the market you're in and the people you help, um, you know what what have Calvert and and your in house folks learned? What what have you learned about valuation? What are the, the kind of the top things you've got to look at that our uh, listeners would really love to know? Sure. Well, um, there's there's so much. Uh, I guess is the one thing that to start with, and 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 uh, uh, I've been doing this for 20 years and our candidate appraiser still teaches me things daily about, uh, about how to do this. And, and I, I've actually grown in my respect for appraisers so much because they go through a lot of education to become the professionals that they are in that, in that market. And, and yet on the other hand, it, what they're doing is not rocket science. Um, what the kind of approaches that they take to understanding the value of a property um, most real estate investors kind of would understand the basics, right? They're looking at the rest of the market. They're looking at comparable properties and and uh, comparing, trying to make uh, this property that's not really uh, is an apple and this other property that's not really an apple. We're going to try and change some things so it looks as much, much like the same apple as possible so that we can compare on a one-to-one -one basis and really judge where the where the value of the property is. There's more to it than that, but that's that's really the absolute basic of it um, that most real estate investors would understand. And um, what maybe is less understood in the residential market, but much more of a topic in commercial real estate, but also to investors who are looking for cash flow is, is that uh, the property is also supported by what it can produce in terms of an income stream, which is valuing the property from, a, from an income point of view, um, which is done a lot less um, for real estate investors, um, or for rookie real estate investors, maybe. Um, but the net cash flow is what's really important to them after mortgaging, but you can also value a property based on the gross cash flow and, and, uh, uh, the cap rate is what they call it. The capitalization rate. And we can get into that in a bit more detail, but I like the comparable, um, approach to valuation because it's really simple. And it's the one that, that most 
uh, realtors and real estate investors, you know, have a basics of understanding about. That's a, uh, that's the classic retail way to analyze properties, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, on the comparable side of things, as opposed to the income producing side is more on the commercial side of things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So, uh, you know, if we're on the residential side, which many of our clients are, um, and we're, and we're looking at comparables, um, so let's have some nuggets here. If we're, if we're in a Perfect. classic subdivision where a developer has come in and built a hundred three bedroom bungalows, yeah, you know, just changing, you know, the entranceway basically, or yeah. other little decorative features. And really that's pretty much the same house, all 100 of them in a subdivision. Uh, is there any difference in, um, is there any difference in what somebody can do with one of those properties on the renovation side, depending on where it is in the subdivision? Does it matter yeah. if you're on a corner or by an alley or? Yeah, yeah, the, the location, um, it's almost an advantage that any evaluator or appraiser has is that you can never get the exact same location on any two pieces of real estate, only one. And so uh, you location is the most unique feature about any piece of real estate where it sits in the world, on the street, in the community. Um, we are we really train our evaluators at our company to watch really carefully for things that would be what we call adverse um, uh, influences to the property, like corner, um, like busy streets or backing onto white bud or those sorts of things with a sound wall, without a sound wall, uh, busy street, does it have a line painted down the center of it or is it quite quiet? Is it on a cul-de-sac? Um, uh, proximity to parks, those sorts of things. And, and what real estate appraisers do to adjust for those things is they have some basic ideas of what is that worth to the market to pay for a quiet street versus a busy street? Because there's that's really what it comes down to is you got to adjust a dollar sign for for the differences between those two properties. Um, and the, the, the absolute best thing to do would be to find out exactly what that subdivision would um, allow and allow a buyer to pay for it in a difference. And uh, you can drive yourself nuts with trying to figure that out on a really specific basis. So much hard work that it's probably not worth it. But generally, you can you can get to a conclusion, you start doing adjustments um, on a location basis um, and move through the rest of the kind of features of the property, which we'll talk about in a bit more. And you get a sense of, of how to adjust up and down for individual features. But the location's a great place to start, Barry, because um, you cannot change the location of that piece of real estate. That's the one thing you can't do. And so, especially for long-term investors, I, I want to invest in properties myself that have good, strong locations. Uh, after the property is, um, the building is depreciated completely, all I've got is the land. And so I want that to be well-located land. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, you mentioned some, some positive and some adverse uh, factors or features uh, for our, our mythical, Three bedroom bungalow and its subdivision of 100 similar bungalows. So uh, adverse thing would adverse things would be on a busy street is number is is one uh, on a corner. Now is a property on a corner? Why would that be adverse? Is it um, because you have too much snow to shovel on two sides. Is that's my personal opinion. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but you can buy a snowblower. That's not that big a deal. And maybe it's a feature for some people. Um, maybe it's a corner that it gives them a view uh, down to a park that they wouldn't otherwise have. So there can it can be positive and negative. Uh, it's all in the eye of the beholder to some extent. Um, but generally speaking, you might look at that and, and wonder, you know, could one of those streets be busy? If so, that might be adverse. Um, could it expose traffic to lights, you know, coming into your window at night? Um, because of oncoming traffic and so on. It's those kinds of exposures that you might not think of normally, those are small dollar amount differences, but they might matter a lot to your renter or your next buyer. Um, and actually that's something I really wanna mention that is the big thing about location for me, why 
I want to invest in real estate where that has a good location. And I want to put mortgages on properties that have good locations because um, in down markets, when there's lots of supply available, people have choices. And sometimes you have to adjust a larger dollar amount than you'd really like to get rid of a property with an adverse problem. You know, if it's, a, if it's, the, if it's the house in the community that is on the busiest corner, um, you know, in, a, in an up market, it maybe doesn't matter too much. But in a down market, it may take a fall that's disproportionate just because the supply is big. So that's, that's I think, whether you're investing in short term or long term, but particularly long term holds, um, I think that's, the, that's a really good thing to keep in mind. You could look like you're getting a really good deal up front, but you may have to pass that deal on when you're a seller. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, that, that comes under the heading when you buy a, you know, a solid property in a solid area. And solid means it doesn't have those adverse influences that can kick you when you're selling in a down market. It, yeah. Be solid in, a solid property in a solid area, that, that helps you in good times and bad, but especially bad. Yes. Sure. Yeah. I love getting discounts um, and, and discounts are great. So if you're, if you're, you can be excited about the discount, there's no doubt about it, but do consider you have to pass that discount on when you're the seller, even if you don't want to sell in the next 10 years or something, you know, it's. Okay. Well, you keep going. You're, we're now into valuations and you, so I'm just going to pop in with comments when I, when I feel the need to. So. Sure. Well, one thing I think I could do and and uh, we're going to make sure everyone gets um, the spreadsheet that um, that Calvert's built really internally for ourselves to value property. And um, really, I use this as a training tool to give my my staff um, a basis to understand valuation. Um, and and the thing that I'll point to immediately is that we've we've compiled really the adjustment guidelines. How do you adjust for certain problems like location, like number of bedrooms, the square footage? I'll go through some more of those, um, but you'll get that regardless today. So even if we don't hit it today, there's lots of good descriptions about that. Um, and the one thing I'll mention is that it's a guideline only. Um, in Calgary and Edmonton, there's certainly a value difference between the two cities. There's value differences between certain communities within each city, but we've boiled down um, a dollar figure for certain kinds of adjustments. Um, it won't cost you exactly $20,000 to build a garage, but that might be the adjustment you make for the lack of garage versus um, a garage or $7,000 for half a garage. That's probably not what it costs you build, but that's the average adjustment that we make internally for difference of properties. And if you're a student of other people's appraisals, you'll see trends between those kinds of adjustments, but nobody has it dialed in to an exact number all the time. It's There's always differences between appraisers on those numbers. And technically there ought to be, for instance, if you're looking at a really expensive neighborhood versus a very cheap neighborhood, the difference between a, um, a half a half a bathroom probably doesn't isn't equal to both properties. Um, so you'll all get these. Uh, maybe I'll share my screen now and give you a bit of a tour of it. But you'll all get these valuation adjustments that we do. Great, let's do it. And um, all right, you should see my spreadsheet on this. Barry, you mentioned toolbox earlier. Here's my toolbox. So. Okay, um, well, let's just see what our what our tech guy Wayne is doing. How is it? We got it up there now? Yes, we do. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so you'll all get this. And um, there's a lot to this spreadsheet, but if we just focused on the adjustment guidelines that you can do to a property, we've outlined all of the ones that we commonly do. Um, and we've given descriptions exactly about what we think they each of them mean. And again, these are guidelines only, so you might find a difference in, in some properties, but this gives you a general way of trying to start to compare. Um, um, if, you're, if you're a realtor uh, and doing this on a daily basis, these are sorts of things that I think every realtor should have 
access to and and use on a daily basis. Um, I'm a realtor myself, not uh, that I practice much, but I've, I've had the training and and uh, we don't get a lot of training in this area of uh, of valuing property. To be honest, as a, as a realtor. Um, so your realtor might not even have access to this kind of uh, level of detail of how to make adjustments. Uh, you'll see I've got explanations of how different kinds of houses are configured so that you can understand a little bit about what the difference between a bungalow is and a raised bungalow and so on. Um, so just some basic guidance material as well. Hmm, interesting, wow. Five level split, wow. I didn't know there was such a thing as a five level split. Yes, uh, and I bet you some would argue there isn't, but. <laughs> uh, so what could I tell you a little bit here? So condition is probably a, a, a really big variable that you can see by the number difference, a lot can be ascribed to condition. Um, and uh, we're really, we're really working hard when we try and make this adjustment because we wanna we want to compare like to like as much as possible. So taking Barry's example, I love the example of you know a brand new built community. Every house is pretty much the same except maybe the foyer. Those are great comparables to look one to one on because there's very little difference between them. But as as communities age. Uh, there, as you can, as you know from driving through these communities, that lots of pride of ownership changes, and the um, the level of maintenance changes over time, and, and you get you end up with a very disparate uh, set of of conditions between properties. So, spending some time understanding what condition the property you're buying in is, and uh, and then finding as similar condition properties to compare it to is really important. And then you you end up with less um, net or gross adjustments, what the appraiser industry calls, if you've got to change a property too much to look like it's uh, compared, comparable Apple, then, then maybe it's not a good comparable at all. So condition is a really big area. Um, the configuration of it, luckily in, in Alberta, we've, you know, most of our properties have basements. Some might not have a basement. Um, some might not have basement development. Um, but uh, finding properties that are most alike in those attributes too is really important. Um, uh, legal and illegal suites. I, I love this area of real estate, especially for your Edmonton investors, because uh, I think you've benefited a lot longer from having the designation of legal suites in Edmonton. And it's, uh, Calgary's catching up to you, but it's been a much easier to approve legal basement suites in Edmonton for a lot longer period of time. Um, and uh, and we even feel that maybe these, these adjustments might be a little light um, because we do see that investors are able to get a little bit more for those legal basement suites um, in Edmonton particularly, less so in Calgary. Um, but for anybody who's actually built a legal basement suite in, you might recognize that that probably doesn't, that difference probably doesn't effectively account for what you'd have to spend to get that legal suite. That is really a problem in appraising. It, we're, not, we're not being asked to value what it costs to get it there. We're asking what the market is willing to pay for that difference. And so sometimes you can invest a lot of money and not get that return immediately. But that shouldn't matter to you if you're a long-term investor um, and you have access to that cash flow over a long period of time. So just a note, on, a side note on that, because you're, you're, it's all in the eye of the beholder. If you are in, interested in the long-term cash flow, it might make sense to build that legal basement suite in, even though the adjustment price doesn't suggest that that's a, a profitable um, investment you know when i when i talk to lots of our our clients and folks we know of, and they're buying a property and their plan is to put a legal secondary suite in um there's some pretty big numbers being thrown around for what it takes to to actually do that i mean it's the costs vary a lot as all things do in real estate but there's substantial dollars to be spent to to put in a um 
a new legal basement suite. So I'm I'm looking at that, and if there's, I mean, I think it would be a factor for people to if you can see a property that has uh, a suite in it, but it's an illegal suite. Putting some effort into figuring out what it will take to make that a legal suite is is a that's a good effort that you can do. It's a really good bit of diligence that you can do on a property. Um, and in Edmonton, as Dale said, we've had uh, the ability to put in legal secondary suites all over the city pretty much for much longer than Calgary. And the city of Edmonton has a, a really good attitude towards suites now. They, they want good, safe housing stock. So instead of turning a blind eye to, to suites, what they're doing is on the one hand, they are encouraging uh, people to uh, put in legal suites, to convert illegal suites into legal suites. They're cooperative if you want some help from them in, in determining um, what it would take to turn an illegal suite into a legal one. They, you know, they will potentially send out bylaw officers, safety codes people, um, the uh, fire the fire and emergency people uh, to come along and they'll give you a list and say, well, you got to do this, this is this and this. And then you can, uh, you can do some estimating about what that might cost. And it's almost always way cheaper to turn an illegal suite into a legal one than to start from scratch and do a brand new legal one. So, yeah. So yeah. And legal is better. Uh, the, the other side of it is the city of Edmonton now actively pursues Illegal suites. They don't just. They're not laissez faire anymore. Wait, wait for, uh, wait for somebody to to call the the snitch line and say my neighbor's got an illegal suite. They actively look, and uh, so uh, it's a, a totally different attitude. But they're helpful on the other hand if you want to make it legal. So that's just a little aside. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a good aside because, uh, like, I've been a little envious, like living in Calgary and watching how how progressive Edmonton was on it, but. Um, slowly, I see Calgary doing the same thing, where they are really helping landlords try and make their basement suites legal. Um, but I think they will tip to the other side once they have uh, more of the more time has passed and more landlords have done this, and then they'll start getting aggressive on those who haven't. Uh, which is a good reminder for me to turn some suites I have into legal ones as well. <laughs> yeah, um, and. And this, I think, is an area where I think at some point the scales will tip where um, right now I see real estate investors wanting to keep the properties that they've made into legal basement suites, which I think makes a ton of sense. So we're not seeing as many transactions in the market on legal basement suites. But I, I think over time, we're going to see that more. And, um, and we may even have some real estate investors focus on that end of the market. If you can buy a really good property undervalued to begin with and put legal basement suites in, um, I think there's some good money to be made in that market. I think it will become more dear to investors to hold those legal basement suites as time goes on, especially as enforcement gets up, like you say. Yes, no, I agree with that. Good. Um, what else have we got here? Um, we give you guidelines for adjusting for parking and all kinds of configuration of parking. Um, we give you guidelines for upgrades. So we have a lot of chats in our office about, about upgrades and um, it can sometimes be difficult to understand what the difference between upgrades and condition is. Um, and uh, it wor it's worth spending a little bit of time understanding the difference because uh, the condition of the property is really like um, how good are the fixtures and the drywall and the hardwood floor that's in place? Is it in good or poor condition? You can have some very ancient types of materials that are in mint condition, right? The, uh, the couch that's been covered by plastic for 30 years is in good condition, um, but it might not be the upgrade that you're seeking. And so the upgrades are the things that are um, uh, are the things that are the materials that have been ameliorated or are better than what the standard builder grade would have allowed for or done. So if you've got a really good uh, kitchen that has had lots of 
fancy upgrades and improvements and top of the line granite and so forth, that's an upgrade. Um, the condition of that granite or the condition of those cupboards is another matter. So we, we try and educate people on the difference because it can be very helpful to understand um, if you put those all in one bucket, you might miss some value um, to you as the investor. Okay. Uh, I see there's a number of categories as there always seems to be. Substantial, good, moderate, average, modest, poor. <laughs> and we can drive ourselves nuts in trying to figure out where it is exactly. But my, real, my recommendation to people is uh, you need not spend a ton of time doing this. But just pay attention. Do you, do you think you've got something above average or below average? If you if you only use those two categories, um, you'll you'll um, you'll be educated a little bit about about the differences between properties and where it should fit in the property and in, in the grand scheme of the value of the neighborhood. So is this? I'm, I'm thinking this is something that our uh, our investors and clients should. Uh, should keep in mind as they're out, not necessarily for every property they buy, but for every property they look at. They should they should have this in the back of their mind as they're going through. What's the condition of this property? What are the upgrades like? Uh, and uh, with the other with the other factors, and I, I'm pretty sure that they you can get to do this um, fairly automatically. I mean, if you limit the, the upgrade side of it to above average or below average, uh, you can you can do that and tick it off and go through. And what's the condition above average, below average? What about the, you know, all, all the ten most important factors, and, and to um, to improve your, your understanding of valuations, you got to look at properties and do it. So, yeah. keep. I, I think we should all be doing it at every property that we look at. It should be going on automatic in the back of our head. Well, I can make it somewhat more automatic for you than that, Barry. Um, what we do, and and not everyone is a realtor, but um, if you can partner with a realtor, if you're not one yourself, to um, to use this tool, we you can actually download all of the comparables that you want to search into a property, and the computer will do these adjustments for you. Um, not as condition and upgrades. You've got to make those. Those are those are um not terms that are necessarily standard in the listing uh descriptions um but uh if you you could my tool explains how to do it or for your realtor on how to do it but they basically download all of the features of the home um and you see we've got lots of different ones the the lot size the building type the year it's built the total square footage above grade and below grade um the frontage of the property, the number of beds, bathrooms, um, full and half bathrooms. Anyway, uh, I think we're over to about 26 or 27 criteria there. And uh, and even if you don't download it yourself, you can you could technically just fill this in uh, between your subject and your and your um, comparables. I'll make this a little bit bigger. And then actually the tool um, does the adjustments um, for you right on the spot. I don't have a good example of, of how it does that, but uh, if uh, you can see that on my two different examples of 100 square feet versus 120 square, uh, sorry, square meters, it's adjusting for 20,000 between the two differences. So some of this is automated. And so you could spend less time calculating differences and just spend more time looking at the end result of what that all means. And even if you skipped um, some of the things that I think ought to be paid attention to, if you're really doing a good job, like upgrades, um, you're going to get quite a good answer to the question, how comparable are these properties? You're going to see whether lots of adjustments need to be made or not very many. Mm -hmm. And it'll so, actually do all the math on it as well. What a great tool. What a great yeah. tool. We've um, so Folks, I want you to I want you to understand. I'm sure your eyes are are wide open and going wow, because Dale said this is available to all of us. I want you to I want you to understand that Dale is um, providing to all of us something that 
I know it took someone a long time to put together and it's been tuned up and fixed and tweaked. And uh, how long have you been using this tool, Dale? I've been using it about two years and I wish I'd been using it for 20 because it makes my job so easy. <laughs> okay, very important point. So, uh, so, so Dale and his company that do this all the time and who have great need for a tool like this, spend a lot of time and money uh, building it. And I know that you've tweaked it because these kinds of programs always, you, you come out, you test them, you have, and, and you have to fix things. And so uh, Dale is providing this to us. I mean, he's, he's giving us to us to use. So uh, this fits right in the category, Dale, of what we, what we tell our students in our focus workshops is that we always play for win-win and we, we cooperate and, uh, and help each other everywhere we can. Uh, not because we're going, aha, if I give away this spreadsheet for sure, I get, my other spreadsheet tells me I'll get 7.5 people in who need a mortgage if I just give away the spreadsheet. Uh, it's not like that. You you give it away because it's a good thing to do because it helps the people you're working with. You continue to work on your job and do the good things that you do. And uh, this will help people. And it's a synergistic way for all of us to move forward on a win-win basis. So that's that's one of the things that I see about what you're doing here tonight. And we, we talk about it a lot in our focus workshops. Uh, this is just another great example of that. So, so that's uh, thank you very much for doing that. I'm glad. I'm glad. And it, you know, I can, I, I, I will apologize for one thing. It can look intimidating, this tool. Um, but I, I would recommend there's two different ways to look at this tool. If you just want to educate yourself on what your real estate agent or your appraiser is doing, then reading those adjustment guidelines is just a good way of getting into their language and getting into their vocabulary. But if you additionally want to use it and, uh, and, and plug in your, your information, um, to do your own study on the property. that uh, There can be some huge value in that. And, and by the way, this might even be another tool that you could use to just uh, update your own values from time to time as an investor. I really like your statement about uh, JV partners. Um, you know, they, you want to report to them on where you see the property value being. Um, this could be a good way to, to do an update and it'd be less less updates the second time you deliver that to them. Uh, you know, the first the first data entry might take a little bit longer, but the second one would be much quicker. Um, and uh, and you're feel free to share this with your realtors as well. Bring up the, the, the level of their understanding of, of your perspective as a real estate investor. Um, uh, they should appreciate that as well. Man, I love this, I love this. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, you, you've you got your own in-house appraiser, someone who I gather has their, has their credential, is that right? Yeah, they're they're a candidate, so they are in the process yeah. of getting their credentials. Okay. In the process, okay. In the process of, and so do you, do you guys in doing your appraisals, do you appraise any differently than another certified appraiser would, would do? I mean, I know, as they say, um, Appraisal is an art, not a science. It's an art. Yeah. yeah. But uh, do you think that do you think that your appraiser goes at it uh, the same as other appraisers, or do you have uh, kind of militating factors because of the lending niche that you operate in and and the particular clientele that you've got, which are real estate investors? Yeah, I would say our 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 approach to appraisal is extremely similar to a to an appraiser. However, we're, we're just starting to lend in Ontario, which we're, we're really enjoying, but we don't have the access to um, the comparables like we do in, on, in Alberta. And what that's teaching us is actually, we do have a bit of a different take on valuing property. We find that we're educating the appraisers we're asking to do work for us, um, mostly in regards to figuring out the after repaired value. We're, we're seeing how it's a bit more of an art to understand you know, I'm I'm seeing what this property is, but now I'm trying to visualize what it will be and and build it that value into that. And that's that's a bit more of an art than we even believed it was. Um, but the principles around doing that are um, really quite standardized to the industry of valuing and and appraising. And so. Um, We've made every effort to really build into our tool exactly what the appraisers would do 
um, directly as well. Okay, all right. All right, well, um, that was a super kind of um, insight into what Calver does and, and to look at the spreadsheet and see how it's gonna go. Donna, who's my spreadsheet person, is going over there. She's just, she's shaking her head at the wonder of it all. <laughs> and uh, I can see her eyes light up. She'll be she'll be immersed in the spreadsheet and I'm sure be running all our properties through it to see whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic or where the heck we're at with it. So um, I'm wondering if um, if we have any questions. We, we like to stop and give people lots of time to ask questions. So um, Wayne, if there's any questions, you can pop them up and we'll We'll try and uh, we'll try and get onto them. Um, if they're not, let's. Um, well, I no sooner say it than Julia has a question. Is the guideline just for residential, or can it be considered for commercial? If not, is there another guideline Dale can suggest? Oh, okay, good question. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Yeah, this this guideline's been built for residential. Um, it would work for a certain number of. Uh, multi-family suites, but I would say it would start to break down when you get into much larger um, multi-family units, like five plus. Now you're you're probably working in a different ballgame. Um, the principles are the same uh, in terms of how you make adjustments, but the numbers and the amounts that you would adjust for um, won't be the same. And again, very different for commercial um, real estate like retail businesses and so on. Um, actually, contrary to what you'd think, it actually is less complicated because it is way more about a, uh, factors of square footage um, and, uh, and they strip away a lot of the features. So it can actually be easier to appraise commercial real estate contrary to what you might expect. Um, and, and actually the, the Appraisal Institute um, does publish some booklets about about how they go about appraising. So I think those would be good places to go if you're looking for resources. Um, um, if you, AACI is the one credential, I don't know what it stands for, CRA is the other one. And uh, if you Google those and with the word appraisal in it, um, they have tools on their website on, on how to adjust. So there's another tool, more tools, more tools. Um, uh, question, we had a bank that sent two appraisals. Hmm, do you know why? Well, I can't say, but I could probably make a few guesses. Um, sometimes, sometimes banks don't like the appraisal they got. Um, if they didn't order it, they maybe want the chance to order it themselves um, and choose somebody third party independent. On the other hand, if they ordered the first one and then they also ordered the second one, it might actually be a, a signal to you that they're trying to make a deal work when maybe they wouldn't just based on the appraisal. Sometimes the um, the bank specialist or the mortgage broker can convince them, hey, I know you didn't like this, but take another try. I think you're missing something in the market here that, that might come out in the second appraisal. So, um, and possibly they've said something adverse that uh, in the appraisal that the bank doesn't like, and uh, but it might be a soft item. You know, it might not be an item that's an, an absolute no go. Um, banks have funny rules with regards to appraisals. Like for instance, they can't say that the exposure time on a property is going to be in excess of ninety days. In other words, if I listed this property, it would take me more than ninety days to sell it. And a comment like that from an appraiser, if it looks bad to them, they might they might refuse a deal completely on that basis. Um, that's a judgment call that an appraiser made. So they might be looking for a way to say yes, even though the appraiser has given them a signal that they say, they should say no. Yeah, it's uh, appraising, appraising is tricky and, and there's, there's nuance to it. Um, I think folks should also know that many lenders have uh, a list of appraisers who are their approved appraisers. And so, you know, if you're if you're working with a lender and you think you want to get an appraisal on your own because you think you're going to give it to the bank, it's probably a good idea to ask your lender slash broker uh, who are the appraisers on your approved list. Because if you pick somebody who's not on the list, you'll spend your money, you'll submit it, and they'll say, "Sorry, we don't we don't take appraisals from this company." So 
That's right. Yeah. Careful about that. Uh, question. What, what is most valuable between a new house and an old house? I'm quite sure I understand that. But anyway, Dale, what do you think? Yeah, that, you know, I mean, obviously the, um, the age um, on its own will, uh, will, ha will have a factor of difference between the two, a new and an old property, which, which requires a, a change in, in, in adjustments. However, you can have old properties kept up in maintenance so that they're just like today's properties. So you, uh, technically speaking, that's what appraisers call the, uh, the effective age versus the chronological age. And so they're looking at, at um, you know, does it look like it's 1960, because that's when it was built, or does it actually look like it's 2000, even though it was, it's been maintained to that extent that it's actually a, a brand new house, um, or, you know, a, a very currently maintained house. So um, your question might have also been kind of pointing to, um, you know, what, what are the other things that are the, the big adjustments between the, the brand new and the, and the old house? And, um, upgrades and condition is where you spend most of your time on that because the condition, not always, but normally is quite different uh, between the, that old and new house. All right. Debbie has a good question. Does this work for condos? Yeah. And I think that's probably referring to the tool. Does the tool work for condos? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and you'll find different adjustment guidelines for condos specifically. The tool can still be used as is, but just making making specific note about, uh, you know, obviously if you're, you may not have a garage in a condo, but you've got an underground stall or something like that. So there's there's difference in the vocabulary, but the, uh, the principles and the tool still works for absolutely both. In fact, I love valuing condos because it's much easier to find good comparables. If it's in the exact same building, you know that the buyers, um, uh, have a very similar view of that property. And so you've got, you tend to get a lot less adjustments between condos in the exact same building. So I find it a treat to do those, those valuations because it tends to be easier. Okay. And what's Chris say? A quick question. Chris, there are no quick questions. You know that. How do you account for neighborhood related differences? Is a basement suite addition worth the same across the city? Oh, that is a good question. That is a really good question. Both of them are. So how do we account for neighborhood related differences? My absolute best advice is find comparables within the exact same community. Try not to go outside of the community. That can be tough. And we find in Edmonton, there are lots of smaller communities. Um, you know, um, in, in my city, in Calgary, there's lots of larger communities where finding a good comparable is not a problem. But if you have that problem in a specific neighborhood where there's just not satisfactory comparables, I would actually prefer to go back further in time and find some in the same community than to go to a neighboring community. And it's not wrong to go to a neighboring community, but do so with caution. Like you, you know, you, and have a think of it this way, it, go and drive those two communities. And do you feel, do you get the same feeling that you do in both communities? Or could there be a value adjustment difference um, you know, is it on the other side of the tracks, for instance, literally or figuratively, um, that it might actually uh, command a different price just based on the feeling. Appraisers will tell you that they're really good and they can compare uh, different communities uh, to properties. But I would say we're not that good. It's a really hard job <laughs> to go outside your community. And then your other question is, could it basement suite be worth something different in different communities. And I absolutely think that is true, particularly from an income standpoint. Um, if you can rent it for more, it's likely worth more. Um, and again, the guidelines I give kind of flatten out that potential difference, but you could certainly make an argument successfully to an appraiser or to me saying that a community at a higher standard um, should be worth more uh, uh, on a basement suite than another. And, uh, but I would just caution, don't make that adjustment a really big difference. So it might be 45 in one community and 50 in another, but it's not likely to be 90 in another. It's not likely to be a large difference. 
Yeah, when I mean when we're talking appraisals, there are things called rent appraisals, aren't there? That's right. You can go and look and see what uh, what a piece of property should be renting for, and make comparisons that way too. All right, and that says if a house that was built in 1950 is selling for 250k, is there a ratio we can use to determine cost of land versus building? Ooh. Yeah, so you'll find in appraisals they have technically speaking every appraiser must have two approaches to valuation and they must agree and the first approach like we've shown you here is the comparable approach the other approach would be adding up the cost to build and replace that and so generally speaking those two approaches must be identical or at least support each other not be wildly different and that's where land value comes in because um in the opinion of most uh, appraisers, uh, what you see is what you get. If you if you if this property burnt down tomorrow, um, the difference, the land value is likely the difference of replacing that house today and the cost of that whole house and property yesterday. Um, there's really no magic in it, though. I mean, I mean to be quite frank, to out us as appraisers a little bit, we. Uh, you you really you really tend to think of the land value as just uh, minus the house. Take away the house. What is the land? The, the, what's remaining is what the land is worth. Um, but it can be more complicated than that. And we do do mortgages for people who are demolishing the house and building new. And I can tell you, you spend a lot of money demolishing that house. And so what you're left with is actually could be a, a cost liability, not just uh, land value. So. Uh, we call some of those things the cost to cure, like the what will it take to really arrive at a land value only, for instance. Yes, getting into some of the complicating factors of appraisal. Yeah, that's what right. About, what about if it's a neighborhood that's beginning to get infill? So another influencing factor, the infills, the skinnies here in Edmonton. Yeah, I love that you guys call them skinnies up there. We 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 uh, have less creative ideas for that. And, and actually, I think it's probably a detrimental terminology. It makes them sound uh, uncomfortable, more like bowling alleys. But um, I think it's a, a fascinating difference, actually, between Calgary and Edmonton that makes, um, makes my approach to infills a lot different. In Calgary, we were restricted for years and only being able to build these skinnies in certain locations, whereas in Edmonton, um, I understand that it's quite easier to have them built in a lot more communities, there's less restrictions. And so I think your question is a good one because um, you see a community in transition when you see individual properties popping up that are brand new. And it can make it the, the job of the evaluator really hard because uh, there may not be another one similarly built in the same community. Um, so it's hard to find a, a comparable. Um, and generally speaking, I would say my approach as an investor, more than a financer, but somewhat as a lender too, the first guy to build an infill in a community is not going to get the full value, uh, particularly not the full value that the 10th guy building it will get. Um, so areas in trans transition, uh, it will take some time for the market to catch up and understand that full value. And, and I would tend to think the first guy in gets a bit of a discount. Um, the last person in might get uh, more what is market value. And appraisers do certainly spend some time actually in adjusting downward for an area in trans transition. So if it, it can be a little uncomfortable for a community to change its, um, its makeup, um, you know, the, uh, um, whether it's uh, the, the older demographic is moving out, a uh, younger demographic is moving in, and uh, sometimes that creates a little bit of discomfort in the community. So that can result in differences in value too. Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot going on when neighborhoods are, are uh, in transition. The lawn, the lawn signs go up. <laughs> no skinnies in this neighborhood. I mean, there can be lots going on. Wow. Uh, what does Olga say? take on the value, view value in a condo. If proposed development would block some units and not others, would all the units be adversely affected on traditional 
comparison. So I guess you're in a condo and a new one is going to be built. And somehow some units are going to lose their light, mm. but other units wouldn't. Hmm. Okay. What about that, Dale? How do we work that into the... It's a really interesting question. And, and you could categorize the whole question in terms of, uh, you know, the long-term value of real estate and paying attention to what um, influences are there today, but could be there tomorrow. Like knowing that your neighbor's lot is empty and, you know, I, I got a great view today, but maybe tomorrow someone puts up a big building and blocks my view. So um, appraisers definitely pay attention to that and watch for potential influences, but their job is to value today your job as an investor is to look out for tomorrow for yourself. And so um, the good news on, on this specific question is that I think, you know, the value may take a technical hit immediately if it, I'm, my view is blocked, but over time um, it probably will even out a little bit. And it might always be down from where it ought to have been if, uh, if, that, if that view hadn't been obstructed. Um, but I, I do tend to believe that you know, the immediate reaction to the market isn't necessarily what the long-term reaction is going to be. And, and it may overcorrect and then come back a little bit too. So I personally wouldn't be a seller too quickly if that was happening. Mind you, if, if the white mud is growing and going to go right through your front yard, maybe that's a different scenario. Maybe that's a long-term influence that, that you should pay attention to because some of those major influences may not correct as much over time. They may get a real big hit initially and never really recover very much. Yeah, so long term, as you say, the appraiser is talking today, you have to talk about tomorrow. And so you have to look around and ask yourself, what uh, what, what do I see as the potential to, to hit my property in this neighborhood over the course of time? So and that's, a, that's a broader kind of macro question that... Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it Got is it. a question to answer, but that's what I love about understanding appraisal better, because if you can understand some of these pr principles in more detail, you can kind of start to see why, um, what long-term investments are better than others. And, uh, you know, this one is located next to an environmental reserve, whereas this one is just an empty lot and I don't know who owns it. And there, you know, you might have the belief that it's always going to be a park, but uh, do your research and find out. And uh, I, I get a lot of real estate investors stopping me and saying, hang on, Dale, you should notice this. This is this is why I love this property. And sometimes they convince me uh, to in increase my long-term view of the value of that property because they're, they're looking ahead even more than I am. I had a client say to me um, the other day that they were uh, thinking of selling their property uh, in an area and I happened to know the property and know where it was and I'm going, Gee, you've got uh, sunrise, you've got sunset. It's a pretty quiet street. There's, I mean, there's a school right down the block. And they went, yeah, that school is unused. And uh, the conversation is on about um, selling the property to a developer. And it won't be a, a school in a big old schoolyard anymore. It'll be, it's potentially going to be a huge development right down the block from me. So, yeah. you know, that's a, something other can come up. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Comparables report is the most prevalent. Well, Dale, you said it's they're doing two things, but comparables is that really where appraisers start? Yeah, yeah, and it really is the tail that wags the dog. Um, I'll, I'll be a little brief in my comments this way, but you know, it is absolutely the appraiser's best practice and requirement to come up with at least two ways of approaching value. Um, but yes, I would say that the comparable approach is absolutely the most prevalent and it will wag the dog because the approach to rebuilding the property um, is really supported by the comparable approach anyway. So it all comes back to the comparable approach. The difference can be if you're actually rebuilding the property, if a property has burned down, if, the, if you actually intend to demolish the property and rebuild on it, now that other approach can become more important. So. It's generally, yes, it's the most prevalent for comparison, but sometimes that can change. Great question here from Belden Palm. How is the condo reserve and reserve fund study factor into condo value? Is there a difference factored, uh, I guess, good versus bad? 
Yeah, you know, we could we could have a different session on condos and and the condo document review alone, Barry. I and I would love that too. We we have good tools for that as well. Um, yes, yes, we're going to do it. <laughs> so um, this is one reason why I would stay to comparables within the same complex or condo corporation because absolutely you can have a difference between two condos where the financial statements are not identical and that can create a real value difference between the two properties so number one stick to the same building if you can but number two as an investor always look at the condo documents really well and i uh, we spend we're, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, uh, particular about this in my office. We, we actually review condo documents the way condo document reviewers do. And a lot of my lender competitors don't. But I'm, I'm a big believer that if these things are overlooked, you can, you can walk into a problem that you don't really want to be around. Um, and that doesn't protect you from the future and how a condo is managed going forward. Um, but absolutely, you're buying a share in a corporation. If that corporation is near insolvent, the value of that property should reflect that. And it doesn't always do that. If a property is going into some financial difficulties, it can take some time for the sales of those condos to be reflected in that, mostly because people don't spend a lot of time evaluating um, what, the re what the lack of reserve or the lack of good financials can do to the value of the place. But it will correct over time. It uh, that's a minefield for sure, for sure. Yeah. Uh, if every comparable on the street was sold over asking price, like it is in Ontario, uh, yeah. would the appraiser still use the sold price or the price of the comps? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. this that's is a moving a, target. Gosh, I I wish we had that problem in Alberta more yeah. often. Yeah. Um, and it's an excellent question, but. You know, you as an investor can pay attention to that. And me, um, I could be given that argument and, and, and that could influence me as well. But the appraiser really is restricted to just see what actually sold. So they can't technically um, make much of an adjustment for that. The exception would be if uh, the property sold some time ago and you're evaluating it today, appraisers do have the latitude of making time adjustments. So they can say, this was sold a whole month ago and the market's gone up since then. And so I'm going to adjust upward for that. And, and certainly if properties are selling over asking price, that's an indication that that value is going up. And quite frankly, the sales will reflect that, right? Like they may not, if all those properties on the same street sold on the same week, they may not reflect that, but over time they will. And you'll get, you know, the appraisers do watch for indications like that and they should be absolutely on top of those kinds of movements in the market. All right, one more. Any more questions, Wayne? I thought there might be one more. That's it, says no, Wayne. One another one from Velden. Is there another one from the great Velden Palm? There is. Follow up. I knew it, Velden. Does rising condo insurance costs per per complex factor into evaluations from the lending side? I suppose. Mm cash flow standpoint, it may be seen then. Hmm. Yes. That's an interesting point. I think it's less of a valuator's question and more of a um, an investor's question, though. Like, certainly as a lender, I pay attention to that. And generally speaking, I have seen condo insurance on the rise. Um, frankly, insurance premiums, period, are have been rising over years. And there's particularly problems in, um, in Fort McMurray, for instance. They have that they had several condos that were even struggling to get insurance. Um, taking the snapshot in time, though, we're really looking at today's value. And so what is today's cost for condo insurance and other expenses? Utilities, you could take the exact same approach. You're mostly looking at what is today's cost, what is today, um, and therefore, what, how does that affect today's value? But a sophisticated investor like yourself, you're looking a little bit ahead and you're knowing that condo fees will be on the rise because of other expenses. Maybe natural gas is going down, but condo insurance is going up. And does that really result in a uh, higher condo fee? An, an appraiser could technically spend a lot of time and do 
careful adjustments between two different complexes on condo fees. And I've, I've been down that rabbit hole. I've spent a lot of time trying. I nearly driven myself nuts doing it as well. Um, but absolutely, there's a difference between what a buyer should pay uh, between two different condo buildings where the condo fees are very unequal. And insurance is one of those areas that's going to keep pushing condo fees up a little bit here in the near future. I don't know about long term, but certainly recently that they have been going up. Yes, insurance uh, all across the board is, uh, is certainly, certainly been rising uh, for sure. Well, Dale, that's all the questions. And so I want to thank you very much for uh, for coming on tonight. I found it all fascinating. Thanks again for uh, providing that fabulous tool for us. Um, I know that we'll be able to, and you'll do what you need to do with Wayne and Donna, and we'll get it out to our people, and they'll be able to have their new uh, their new tool, which everybody's going to be very happy about, uh, for sure. Um, so for future times, uh, to do something, to maybe delve in a little deeper on condo and condo reserve funds and reserve fund studies and how you look at it and analyze it, uh, big factor, huge difference between different condo corps and how they handle this and a really big thing for people to delve into. So that'll be a future topic. Uh, we've told our folks before, uh, and I'll just say it again, that we do plan to do a financing focus workshop in the new year. So that would be, uh, you know, a, a day long workshop that delves into all aspects of financing, including what you do with Calvert and all of the other insights that, that you might have in that area. So folks, Dale will, uh, we, we, when, not if, when we get that focus workshop tuned up, Dale will be participating. So that'll be good. And then I just want to finish with, I just want to remind everybody, as I said earlier on, that uh, uh, Dale's a great friend of investors and, and of our focus workshops and the people we work with. He's got a real solid niche that he that he works in. He, they can do things quickly. Um, they, can, they can really help out and show you why working with a company like Calvert is uh, to your best advantage. So uh, please remember, to, if you need financing, especially if you need short-term financing or fast financing or out-of-the-box financing, then get in touch with Dale. At, uh, Albert. Thanks again, Dale. Thank you too, Barry. Let's sign up. Uh, we're, we're done for the evening. Do you see the halo over my head? Can you see that? Yes. Look at that. Okay. Halo done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're done for now. Um, I'm going to crack myself a beer and Donna's going to cook some supper and we'll catch up to you later. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.